Gabriela Michu. Uh, she's a postdoc at the Institute of Neuroinformatics. And uh, she came to Europe all the way from Mexico many years ago to study neuroscience and computational neuroscience. And she ended up to meet, uh, with, uh, uh, to meet uh, Rodney Douglas at the Institute of Neuroinformatics. And there they managed to get very nice simulations of how the brain grows. And this is the title, Self-Construction of the Brain. And I'm sure you will enjoy this uh, new perspective of computational neuroscience. Thank you, Sergio and Paolo, for inviting me to be here. And yeah, I, I have a similar case like Sarai. I mean, I was also, I studied biomedicine, but not, not in the engineering, just the lab. So I mostly was specialized in molecular biology by the time of my bachelor's. And I also did a lot of experiments with um, rats. And at some point, I was more inspired for the computational neuroscience. And, but I also always liked uh, development. So I tried to look some place that would actually combine development with computation. And I, I looked for places. And then I ended up in Zurich. And actually, Sarai and I were in the same lab for our, during our PhD. So I will tell you a bit of the approach that we take for, for development, which is basically different to the, thi to the things that you see in the lab. And please interrupt me at any point if you have questions. So what, what I, I like to think about of a biological system is in contrast, in contrast to a technological system. And it's when you see any kind of technology that you have around you, like cell phones, airplanes, car, racing cars, um, we are confronted with something that someone uh, specialized on the design and on, the, on how the, the mechanism um, is focused on. And then for building a racing car of this type, there were some specialized engineers that had to first um, assemble, all, like f figure out what components does a racing car need and have them in a map. And then later they needed to assemble it following a particular blueprint that tells specifically which uh, parts of the car have to be uh, going together in order that you have a very functional and fast car that you have. And this not only applies for, I mean, I use technology as an example, but for instance, the table or the chairs that you are sitting on, then were also designed from the top with someone that had in mind what kind of task the system was supposed to do. And then, just to give you an example and show you how it works, for building, for building cars, this is the BMW factory, and these robots have specialized tasks that people programmed, so in order that you will end up having a brand new car. But also, um, there are also engineers on the back of this project um, assigning or programming these specific robots or also instructing other people in order that at the end you have this car that is at the end in the last stages finished by humans. And then this is a nice video of it. So yeah, basically, behind technology, there is always a human that had in mind what they wanted to do. And then, so what happens with biological systems? So in the case of biological systems, it starts with one single egg, which gets fertilized by a sperm, I mean, in the case of mammals. But then, the, all the instructions come, come from there, and there is no person or some designer that tells what this cell is supposed to do. Now I hope I can run this bit. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, so basically, the fertilized egg starts to divide during many rounds of division.
And then, I mean, if we focus also in the case of the brain, you have specialized precursor cells that start to divide, and these were labeled by the experimenter in the lab in order to follow what the progeny is of which particular cell. So, I mean, this way you can actually trace families of cells just by looking in the lab which one was the ancestor of which one. And because this is difficult and it takes a lot of time, we actually take the approach of simulations of brain development. So you start also with some precursor cells that will divide and give rise to the structure that you are studying. And in particular, we are interested with the cerebral cortex, which is the part that allows you to do anything that you can do. Basically, think, sit here, go to one, from one place to the other. And actually, I'm going to go more into specifics of how this actually works. So these, all the different colors give rise are, are um, cell types, and these cell types are the ones that are forming the cortex. And you, we also have arborizations, and this is just another look of how the cortex looks at the, in our model. I mean, and the software we use is cort called Cortex 3D, and this is a software that you can download, and it's open source, so you can basically download this software and you can start building little neurons, little circuits, or little substructures. So yes. Just as a small conclusion of the videos that I showed you, in technological systems, you have specific designers that know how and what you want to build. You get the components, you assemble together until you have the working system that you want. And in biological systems, on the contrary, you have specialized stem cells that divide many types, times and they give rise to the different cells in your body. And in particular, because the cerebral cortex is what allows you to think, and we're interested in brains, then I will focus on the part of brain development. So this is, this is how the software is called. And what do you think you, a simulation software, would need to have in order that you can do feasible uh, simulations of brain development? Any ideas? I mean, you can really have basically any software that can give you something, some behavior that you are observing, but this is not actually really close to what you want to do or what you are actually observing in developing systems. So any ideas of what you would need to, do, to have in a software? I mean, you need empirical-based constraints, right? Yes. That's essential. Yeah. And you have to have data, and then you have to those present constraints to your design. Yes, and, in, and if we just go to the software specifically, what, what do these cells would need to have? Biochemistry? Sure. Genomes? Sure. Probably maybe? Sure. Connections? Connections, mm -hmm. yes. Signaling? Signaling? Functions. Yeah. Uh, mapping? Like making sure you know where the cell goes in space because that will determine but signaling? Who needs to know that? I mean, yeah, but that's exactly a good point. Because cells, do, do you think cells know where they have to go? Well, they, they go according to signaling, right? Yes, but they don't know where, to, where they have to go. And this is the, the magic of biology. There is no one telling what the cells have to do. So basically, following the biological principles, it also requires that these cells are not manipulated by one by one, so that the emergent, you see, observe the emergent behavior. Right, so, so what I meant is the tracking system to, to, to yes. figure out okay. where yeah. they are yeah. going. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Okay, so all of these things have been thought through during this, when they developed this software, and this is Cortex 3D, where what the, the most important thing about this software is that any particular cell is not aware of what's happening around it, but just you, you will see that there are actually structures that are emerging by following really <laughs> local rules. So these cells actually following local rules, local gradients, and of course they have a space, they have volume. So if you see two cells close to each other and one bumps into the other, 
one will move because of thermodynamics and because of space. So this is in, in 3D, so it's called Cortex 3D because these cells are actually in 3D even if you see them 2D. And let me just show you an example of one simulation that a, a student actually in Capocacha where he visited a couple of years ago he did. And what he wanted to, to simulate a fish embryo, I mean, you need a bit of imagination, <laughs> but these cells, at the beginning, they come together just by, they don't know where the other cells are, but they, they um, produce substances that keep them together. And then some population of cells start to express purple and pink sub, um, substances, and these two kinds of substances attract each other. I mean, cells with these substances attract each other. And then for him, this was the head and this was the tail, or the opposite. But this is just to show you the principle of how it can work in order to build larger structures such as the cerebral cortex. And we use the software for growth and development of cells. This is, again, as I said, it has to be in a three-dimensional environment. And it's agent-based, which, which means that there is not a global controller of um, who's directing the cells what they have to do. And um, one nice aspect of this software is that it only has nine ways to, like there are only nine functions that these cells can do. And nevertheless, you can achieve um, larger structures. So you have growth of cells. So a cell can start, I mean, when it's born, it's tiny and it can grow. It can divide, it can die, branch, uh, sign up, secrete, detect, move. And there are other primitives that um, they can use to stop, for example, if, as, if an axon is extending somewhere and it detects a substance that it's aversive to, then it has to stop. So just with this simple software and with local rules, you will see that um, all the simulations that we have are only done with these principles. Yes? Is it at all based on the game of life? Well, uh, a bit. I mean, you can... Um, it's basically, you can observe the same, the same patterns, and it's also local, but in that case, you would not observe branching. Right. Or, so it, it, it has some, some of the principles, but of course it has to be extended for biological systems. So yes. And I, I'm going to show you the simulations for, corti for cortex development. And in cortex, at the beginning of development, so in, it, it is basically very similar to mouse, humans, and monkeys. And first I will show you what the mouse development looks like, and then we can think of how difficult it would be to, to see the same kind of development, to do a simulation of this in, in monkey. And I will tell you the difference between a mouse cortex during development and a monkey cortex during development. So basically, the gestation period of a mouse is of 20 days. And then, at the beginning, there are some precursor cells at line at this layer, which is the ventricular zone. And then at, at, the, at the next stage, so, so this means embryonic days. Then you will formulate the preplate, which is another layer. And then there is another compartment, the subventricular zone, which is also a um, compartment that will create new neurons. And then you will, uh, you will, in the next stage, you have the marginal zone, the subplate, so ventricular zone, and the ventricular zone. So basically what you have is a sandwich that is growing from the inside. And then it continues for more days until you have a newborn mouse that has its brain already at least at the layer level developed and the, uh, the connectivity still needs to go further, but at this, this is the stage of, so this is the days previous to the mouse is born. So basically all these colors just mean different cell types and layers that are there. And what people did in the lab before I joined it, was that um, you observe these waves of cells that are being produced at different time points. And for example, you start 
from E11 to E19, at the embryonic stage E11 to E19, and during this period you have the formation of the six layers of the cortex. So let me draw it for you. <coughs> So it will be this like a close-up version of the picture that we saw before, because in, in this image, so basically the part that we will have the connectivity and the, the the cells that are going to to are not transient but are staying there during development are the CP, which stands for cortical plate. So the cortical plate is what I'm going to draw for you. Okay. Yes. In this paradigm is is the have a more do door sort of thing. Yeah, basically if you do a slice of your brain, like a coronal section uh -huh. of your brain, so layer one is what ends up at the top, so the, okay. so, yeah, so ventricular zone lines the ventricles, so this is the closer to, I mean, you see a mouse brain, so this is the ventricular zone, and all cells are being produced here, and this is the top of your, of your head. So basically you start with the ventricular zone, which are these precursor cells. And what is very special about these precursor cells is that they ex ex extend very long glial processes of this kind. And basically when cells divide, um, this will serve, uh, they are called, some people call them end feet. And so they will help to guide the daughter cells of these cells to the top. So basically, if you look at one, only one of these, you are relating it to this is the family of one precursor cell that is staying at this place. So at the beginning, they, they create layer one. And then another, another stage, so layer, it's, so because I said you have a sandwich which is filled in an, in an inside out way, so then you have layer six and the ventricular zone. Then layer one is basically your stop signal. And then you have layer five that goes through layer six, layer six and your precursors. And then you have layer one, layer four, layer five, layer six. And finally, you end up with layers two and three, four, five and six. So this is, the, it's called the inside out formation of the cortex. And basically what it entails is that cells bypass the previous generation of cells until you get at the end the, the layers of the cortex in this way. And this is what you are going to see in the simulations. Do they have any relationship to sort of the evolutionary emergence of layers? Yes. Do we have, I don't know, the layering of other mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so if so, this is mouse mm -hmm. basic, and then if you would see um, a monkey brain, uh, I will show you later some images. But what you have is m more more amounts of layers. You have more transitional layers, some layers that people don't, are not sure for what what they are good for. And then, um, especially between mouse and monkey, the difference is that there is a, a subcompartment of precursor cells that gives rise. So this two types of cells, are they come from two different compartments. So these come from the ventricular zone, and these come from the subventricular zone. So this layer, you start to see it during mouse, like in mouse, you have a very fine layer of subventricular zone precursors, but it's not, not at all compared to the amount of cells that are being produced by the outer subventricular zone. So basically in, in monkey, this is called OSBC. They create a massive amount of cells. And this is one of the main differences. And in human, you can also observe these compartments. And basically, the evolution of time, you have from less layers to more layers. Basically, the hippocampus is a more ancestral structure. And then, so you have turtles, you have like three layer, layers. And then in more in evolutionary time, you get more layers and more, more um, compartments that are, some of them are transitional, some of them stay there for some time. And yeah, so basically, that's the evolution of the layers. Time. It is, it, I'm sorry to be <laughs> 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 So let's say the turtle, right? 
would mm -hmm. it be the equivalent of like layer six, layer five, and layer one? That's where the thermal will stop, or is it more complicated than that? N no, it's well. I mean, in layer term, it is, but it will be just two, three simple layers. Mm -hmm. It's it's more less complicated than than mouse during development and, and in evolution. So it, it would be as if you would create, for instance, like this tree. But it, but since they don't have a cortex, then I'm not going. I'm not, I'm not talking about this in the terms of, of turtles. So yeah, it's just with time you see. Well, with more evolution, you see more layers, more cells. So you have basically in in monkey also you have layer one, layer two, three, four, five, and six. But the the distribution of cell numbers is also very different. That's another thing that to consider when you look at evolution. So in the, the part of the experiments that people did for creating the mouse uh, cortex, they started, they observed that the timing between E11 and E19 is where you create all these cells that I just explained to you. And um, what they did was to label cells at these particular time points. So basically you label a precursor cell. Let me see if I can find that. Okay. Imagine this is a marker of some kind. And then all the progeny of these cells are also going to be labeled with this color. So because they divide, they get, like it fades away with time. But in this way, you can track which kinds of cells come from a particular precursor. So in this way, you can see. And then if you make a slice of your brain, and then you see in which layer you can actually find purple cells, then you know at which particular time cells are being produced in order that you get cells at a particular location. So by, com by combining this way of getting these cell numbers, because at every layer has a particular distribution of cells that are being produced, then they came up with a model of gene regulation of how you could achieve such a, such a structure with all these layers at these particular times. So this is what we call GRN, which stands for Gene Regulatory Network. So you were right when you said that we also need genetics in the program. So this is basically the Gene Regulatory Network for mouse. It looks very complicated, but the only thing that you need to, to take out from this picture is that there are some genes that activate or inhibit some others uh, until you create the cell that you observe at the end. So basically here, you see layer six cells, which are the ones that are being produced after layer one in the formation of the mouse. And then every single precursor cell in the simulation will have this kind of network inserted into it as if it would be a, the small DNA of the, of the cell. And with this, you can create a mouse cortex. So this is just a simplification of what I showed you there. You start with the ventricular zone, and this ventricular zone creates the marginal zone, which is in the future called layer one. And then this ventricular cell divides, creates more ventricular zone cells, but also starts to create subplate cells. And subplate cells are just a particular cell type that it's, it's transient, it will disappear. So at the end, that's why you don't see it in that diagram. And then you create more ventricular zone cells, and these ventricular zone cells will create layer six, and then more ventricular zones, uh, cells, and then you create layer five, layer four, layer two, three, and then you end up having your cortex. So let me now show you uh, in our simulation software how does this look, and you can judge for yourself if it looks similar or not. So basically, this is, this is just a preview of, of, what is of, of the emergence of the layers of the cortex. But these cells are able to extend projections. They are able to, to sense particular substance that cells are, are producing. Here comes the thalamic input. And then these are, this is a source of inhibitory cells that is being produced that will go to the layers of the cortex. Because when I talk about 
the formation of the layers of the cortex, I was only referring to excitatory cells. And if you want to go into the details of inhibitory cells, we can also talk about it. But first, let me show you the simulation of the mouse. And here you can see that it's in 3D. So you have these arborizations that are going in all directions. And the cells in the, bot in the top that you see are layer one cells. And of, co of course, for taking a picture of this kind, we remove the other cells so that you can see the whole tree of the cells. Oops. Okay, so these gray cells that are here, they are sitting on top of the ventricle, and this will be the source of inhibitory cells. So just as a small, um, just a small introduction to inhibitory cells. So this is the way in which excitatory cells are being produced. And then inhibitory cells are produced in another compartment far away of the cortex. And this cell, what they have, so these cells all migrate radially because the structure of the glia that they have here as a precursor. But these cells are very special in the sense that they are being produced far away and nevertheless they go into the cortex. So A, they first have to travel long distances to go into the cortex. And they, they go here, they migrate tangentially, and then they also migrate through this radial glia to the right uh, layer. So even if these cells are being born at a huge distance and they are not talking directly to each other, they, you manage to create layer six cells and layer six inhibitory cells from different locations that they come together at the, at the developing cortex. So this is something which I, I, I find very interesting. So this is the compartment. So these are called marginal, um, so caudal ganglionic eminence and medial uh, ganglionic eminence. So these are these compartments where these cells are being born, but this, those names are not important right now. And here, this is the collection of ventricular zone cell precursors that all contain this gene regulatory network of 36 genes that I was talking about. And then I will show you now how the, the cortex grows. So layer one is being produced. This is a marginal zone called later layer one. Then at the lighter yellow, maybe you cannot see it very well, it's the subplate here. And you create more ventricular zone cell precursors that give rise to layer six, layer five that bypasses layer six, and layer four that bypasses layer five and six and the lighter yellow will produce layers two and three. And then here is the migration of inhibitory cells that is coming from these other compartments. And this is just to show that these cells, by looking at the local vicinity, can um, arborize. Yes. Are the black morphologies reconstructions from? Um, there, are, there are some. So they, they've been. Um, we, we didn't go very much into the detail of that, but actually you can um, observe many more morphologies that we are actually not showing here. So basically, here, imagine it's just the sum of the cell, and of course, although we care about the their morphology, we didn't go into the whole details of that. You had a, a question? Yes, so how long does the whole process take? Okay, so this, the simulation that you just saw was 200,000 cells being born, and it took around six hours to grow. And what you saw, of course, in two minutes is just a very quick way in which the process happens. 
But the, the, the thing about Cortex-3D is that it can also be parallelizable. So if you want to run it faster, you can spread your works into different computers. So that's a good advantage if you want to run larger simulations. And for instance, the monkey that you will see later, I can also run, I, it was less, less cells, and if you let it in your computer run for a while, then you can also in a couple of hours have the whole layers, but it's of course a smaller size of um, thickness of cortex. And that's why we also didn't do many layers of precursors from like the front to the back, but we just took a small one layer of precursors so that you can actually observe how it works. And what you didn't see in the simulation are these arms here, just because when you let them show it them to you, like the simulation is all gray and then they are there but not shown to you. So, so far with this, we have a, a method where we can simulate um, the development of the cortex. And of course, all these, all these numbers of, of distribution of numbers of cells, they were taken with collaboration with people that actually are following step by step the different cells that are being produced. And this was basically the outcome of the mouse simulation. But we were also wondering, as you asked, um, what happens in other animals? And here you can see the difference. So these two images are drawn to scale, and just by eye you can see that the thickness, there is a big difference between the thickness of the cortex of macaque and a mouse. So it takes longer. So you need six months to, to gestation to get a baby monkey. And a mouse, you can get it in 20 days. But also, this time of development also gives rise to different layers, which are the ones that you see in other colors. Outer fiber layer, I mean, the names are really not important. But here is the compartment of the outer subvertebral zone that I was telling you about. And this is um, going to produce the upper layers of the cortex. So besides the number, the thickness, and the other layers, the principles are the same you start creating um, the cortical plate, also in an inside-out fashion. And some of other differences that people have observed is that instead that all the inhibitory cells come from a compartment which is located far away of the cortex, there, are, there is also thought that there are some precursors of inhibitory cells also located at the ventricle. So you have um, cells produced here, inhibitory cells, but you also have cells that are being produced by the really idea. So those are, in general, the differences between a monkey cortex and a mouse cortex. So then the question is, how much do we need to change the original gene regulatory network that we had to actually be able to grow a monkey cortex? So this is the gene regulatory network of the macaque that we came up with. And basically, the difference between the 36 artificial genes that we have versus the, the monkey cortex is that we only inserted one more node, which is the node that is going to give rise to the outer subventricular zone population. So with a ch small change in the sweet spot of the network, and of course different numbers of cell cycle, because if, in, there is, if, if you also observe the monkey, they have different cell cycles, and also, of course, that gives you a different number of cells that are being produced. Just with, that, with those changes, we actually got to grow a monkey cortex with Cortex-3D. So here, I mean, if you only see the cell states that I showed you before, so this was for mouse. This is the part that is, is going to be born from the outer subventricular zone in monkey. So you, this is the insertion of the new node that is going to give rise to the upper layers. And cells, uh, these colors here mean that inhibitory cells are being produced also in this part. So let me show you now the simulation of monkey. So 
So here it's, it, I will run a, a smaller size of Cortex just for the purposes of the simulation so that they would run faster. But imagine it, would, it is as long as the one that we have of mouse. And then here, again, you have the ventricular zone precursor cells. And here, something that we didn't show in the mouse simulation is the thalamic input. So the thalamus projects towards the cortex and it's known that both the thalamus and the cortex need each other to grow. So if you have a young thalamus and an old cortex, the thalamus will not grow. If you have a very um, young cortex with an old thalamus, it will not grow. So basically you need each other at the same times in order to grow correctly. So these thal the thalamic cells are going to project towards the cortex and then towards the layers. So again, you start with layer one, marginal zone. Then the, the thalamus starts to project towards the cortex and waits there for longer periods of time. This is called the handshake. Then the production of the subplate starts, which is here in lighter yellow. And then at some point you will see some purple cells which are going to appear and then stop to be produced. So this is the beginning of the formation of the outer sun ventricular zone population. It just starts and stays while the ventricular zone keeps growing. give rise to layer six and five, so six, and the orange cells are inhibitory cells, and then the green, which is layer five, that bypasses layer six, and then suddenly there is this massive increase of other subventricular cell cells that are being produced. Layers two, three in blue. Sorry, four. <laughs> and then two and three in lighter blue. And then once the layer four cells are being produced, the thalamic, the thalamic input starts to project towards the cortex and it branches. It's known in every layer, but mostly in layer six and layer four. So you see these arborizations here. And people always ask me why you see it like a bit shining, but it's, it's just because of the rendering of our program. Do you have any questions so far about the simulations? Yeah, maybe it's a really real basic question, but how can you, um, like, genetic, yeah, genetically, code, okay, code the, the connection between uh, layer six, thalamic, uh, mm, mm -hmm. to layer six and layer four? Okay. Because maybe you can uh, to a protein. Uh, you can um, like code a channel development, mm -hmm. but how are we like morphic 
development, development can be described. described. So I, 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 can you repeat your question? Okay. Again? So uh, through genetics, mm -hmm. you can code like a protein, uh, something like uh, I suck at genetics, biochemics, <laughs> and stuff. You think you can help? Okay. okay. So I think the question is, how can you uh, code for axon guidance? Is yeah. That it? Yeah. Uh, so how can you code for projections? And I think the answer to that is just signaling and sort of repelling an attractive substance. Well. In this case, so this is actually the next step that I, I was going to go there. I mean, I, I'm just going to show you like what we think about connectivity and how it can be solved in these kinds. Oh, okay. But then for, so if we talk about short range projections, which are the ones that you saw from the thalamus to the, to the layer six and layer four, it is through signaling of what these cells are secreting. So basically every single cell in these uh, simulations that you saw are secreting its own substance whatever you want to call it, just their own substance. And when the thalamus, the thalamus doesn't know where these cells are, but as it passes by and it senses this substance, it knows, oh, okay, I'm surrounded by this substance, I can branch. So this is the only rule that these cells are following. And then you have bigger affinity for layer four, that's why you see further arborization in layer four and less for layer six. But this is basically just by local rules how these axons in the simulations are, being, are getting through the right location. And the question that we haven't solved with this is long range axonal guidance, which is like, I'm going at least to pose you what the problem we think it is. And I won't go into the details of that because I wanted to go more into the Allen brain uh, stuff, but we can also discuss about that. No, I mean, what's known in most cases about long range axonal, long range axonal guidance is mm -hmm. there is no long range axonal guidance. It's stepwise guidance. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are, yeah. there, are, there, are, there, are, there are directions from A to B and then separate directions B to C and this can, this can progress through many, many checkpoints. Yes, but if you look at the axon, I mean, the axon had to go through a long distance in order to go to these places. So of course you have a lot of local uh, signaling happening at different points and you also have guidepost cells that would allow you to go from one place to another, but that doesn't explain how a neuron knows where this long range target is located in space. So that, that, that is like the way in which we are approaching the problem of connectivity. Yeah, but I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that, the, that there are I mean, there are, there are a bunch of rules that, that can control axon guidance. Um, uh, the, but in terms of like diffusible factors, mm -hmm. or factors that are laid down in gradients, mm -hmm. I mean, there are limits in terms of, 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 of distances course. that they accomplish. Yeah. And so uh, because of those limits, yeah. uh, that, that axons actually need, uh, they need new reinforcing and cancelling signals to various steps along their yeah. trajectories. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, and also I mean one of our big arguments against um, morphogens, secret morphogens, is that they do not provide you I mean if you read classical textbook neurobiology or development, you will see that there are diffusible factors yeah that are guiding the axon, which of course if you put an axon and you observe it under the microscope, you can actually see that these signalings are attractive or rejecting. But if you are in the real brain, surrounded by many of these signaling factors, where are you supposed to go? So this is one of the things that we also <laughs> worked on. So I mean just as a closing part of the, the part of the cortical structure and emergence, I mean, what, we can, what can we use these uh, simulations for? I mean, there are known molecules that are being knocked during particular diseases that before going into the lab and seeing what effect it has in the mouse, you can actually use these models for running these simulations and see what could actually happen. I mean, there is a mutation where you, where you, where you uh, mutate a molecule in layer one, and basically you don't have your stop signal anymore. So instead of having this formation of the cortex in this way, you get it inside out. Basically, the, the layer six goes here. I think this cell is not working, so then you have an inverse cortex. And these are known things that happen. 
if you have a problem with a particular molecule. So that's why we we use these models for we could potentially use these models for mutations or disease or connectivity. But actually, for Zika virus, I mean, it has been maybe not you don't hear about it so much, but in the past years, Zika virus was very big in Latin America, and it was supposed to affect the precursors at this level, so when the layers of the cortex are being born. So that's why you had babies that were born with the frontal part really, really small, because these cells were not developing uh, naturally. So in, for these kinds of um, diseases, or for this kind of work, we, can, we cannot grow mice with <laughs> Zika virus all the time, or we cannot see, observe how babies are born because not every uh, baby was infected with Zika virus, but then you can use basically the simulations for exploring mutations or disease. And then now I, I would like to, to move a little bit into the problem of connectivity at long-range level. And although I'm not going to go into the detail, at least I want to tell you how we were thinking about it. So basically, if we think about the number of neurons that an organism has, we have invertebrates and vertebrates. And when you look at the number of neurons that invertebrates have, they have very small numbers of neurons. For example, you recognize this? Sea urchin has some types of cells have 40 neurons, then you have C. elegans, 302 neurons, and, and then if you go to vertebrates, then we have larger amounts of, of neurons. So basically a mouse has estimated, these are of course estimations, 71 million neurons, and if we go to the case of humans, we have 86 billion neurons. So when we think about it in invertebrate, the number of neurons in invertebrates and connectivity, it could be feasible that you would have a connectivity matrix with whom do you have to connect. But if we go to the cases of mouse and human, this would be imaginable if you would have a super huge genome and with the storage capacity. But if you have a genome which is estimated in 1.5 gigabytes of storage capacity, how can you know where you have to project? So this is one question that we've been wondering in the past years. And this is basically the calculation. So the one cell here that extends its axon and projects has 1.5 gigabytes if you count the number of base pairs. But if you would have, if neuron would have a connectivity matrix of any other neuron, I mean, and let's say the 86 billion are 10 to the 10 neurons, it will be estimated in 425 terabytes. So this massive amount of discrepancy in the number of, of DNA or the storage capacity that every cell has makes us think that there must be a mechanism in how neurons find its synaptic target, which is not encoded in this small amount of DNA. Yes? But once you start producing interaction between a piece of the chrome and the DNA, you can, it doesn't it sort of go up, the capacity for, for expression of information? I mean, what, but it's, it's basically, if you start with one, if you come just, I mean, I, I'm just going to go based maybe into the Shannon's form of theory. So let me just move here a bit. So if you consider this framework, where basically every base pair is one bit, and then just combinations of uh, base pairs give you eight bits. So then you end up with the, the calculation of 1.5 gigabytes. Of course, you can go into epigenetics and a recombination, molecule recombination, and this probably would allow you to have um, more capacity of storage, but it nevertheless doesn't get to the level of terabytes, which is the estimate that you would need to have if you would know exactly where every other neuron is located in the brain. So I just, just out of curiosity, I just wanted to know, the, to show you like how you get to this estimate of the 100 terabytes. So you have basically the 86 billion neurons, it's like 10 to the 10. 
and then if you would um, you would calculate 30 bits per connection and then you end up with a calculation of 10 to the 14 synapses I mean in, in the brain so basically if you multiply this 32 times to 10, 10 to the 14 we that's an estimate of course 425 terabytes and it's just this huge discrepancy that has um, made us be closer to the world of transcriptomics, RNA, and that's why I'm now going to move forward to the part of the alien brain. Do, you, do we have questions? So Sarai mentioned right now some um, one way in when we, we could classify cells and that would be either by morphology, which we didn't exploit in the simulations, or by firing pattern. Another one could be gene expression. You can also consider where a particular uh, population is located. So if you are considering that layer one cells or layer five cells, or a particular uh, subtype of cells that are only in one of these layers or not, um, by the morphology, the connectivity, the electrophysiolo uh, electrophysiological properties, and functions. And lately, um, so I'm interested in genetic expression and the Allen Brain data database is some, um, something that you can actually use to explore these kinds of data sets. So just this, as a small reminder, I mean, from, this, uh, from DNA to RNA is transcription, and this is the part that, I'm, that we are looking at at the moment. And what kind of analysis can we do when we look at transcriptomics? So you can check which and where and whose genes are being expressed where, if they are on and off, in which particular cell, cell types, tissues, or layers. Um, you can check um, what kind of cells uh, of genes constitute a particular cell type, when, which genes are, are being used for a particular function. So for example, if you, you have a disease that affects a particular uh, cell population, and then you identify which are the genes which are key for this population, then probably these genes are very crucial for this cell to exist and therefore for the function and then how also these changes can contribute to disease and people are also interested in what kind of genes are involved in function, in health and disease and then also there are, even though there are 20,000 genes that people have described it, then you need to know what actually all these genes are doing. And some of them, because they don't give you a clear phenotype, then people are use this kind of data in order to know what these kind of genes can potentially do. So I'm going to go now a bit into the... So the Allen Brain is an institute in Seattle that dedicates all the people to um, provide open data for the community. And briefly at the end, I will show you what's the name of the website and what kind of data sets you can look at. But I will just right now show you two of them which I, which I find, A, I work with them, and two, I find them particularly interesting. And then, of course, every time they publish the data set, you can also access um, the, the first paper, which is they deliver the data set and they public, they goes accompanied by a paper. So you can read about these data sets first in the paper, in the website, and then you can access their, their website as well. So for instance, there is this, there are these two papers in 2016 and 2018, which are um, with what are the building blocks of the brain. So basically this concerns the different cell types. And what they do is they do they have all the pool of cells that they could identify, and then they do clustering analysis by gene expression, and they came up, at the end, they show a clustering diagram of what kind of cell types they found, if they were described before or not, or what particular new cell types have been identified. I mean, we can, of course, argue if this is the correct way of how to do it, but what is good about this is that is we can all access this data, and we can judge for ourselves, or we can do another kind of analysis. 
So this is one particular um, data set that I will show you uh, later. And then, for instance, in the paper of 2016, they, had, they identified 49 set types, where they identified 42 um, types that were neuronal to non-neuronal. And you can actually, in the website, let me see if I can access the website. It's not open. Yeah. Well, it's it's kind of like nine. Okay, let me let me just then share. It doesn't. It didn't work for me, but I can use my phone. This looks a little bit like the uh, colorblind testing plate. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> something is written there. <laughs> so basically, just. I mean, this is an illustrative um, thing that they had, just so that you can look. I mean, this is one of these test cases that they have, and they have the taxonomy of mouse visual cortex, and then they go deeper into the... the so basically, first, they did clustering by neuronal types and non-neuronal types, so these are the non-neuronal types and the neuronal types. Then the non-neuronal type, you could identify different cells, which are these branches over here. Excuse me, is this branching based on the notion that the node in the branching is they're calling a change in, in from one type of expression pattern to another? Yes. And they're basically they're making an assumption. Yes. The assumption yes. is that is the assumption is that. Uh, there's an ancestry type behavior exactly. via <coughs> epigenome, which yes. may not hold, but that's yeah. the yeah. That's what they do. Yeah. And that, I mean, people still discuss if this is the proper way to do it, if this actually classification is really real, because I mean, the Petilla classification, which Sarai mentioned briefly, they were mainly interested in interneurons. So basically, the whole community is saying we have more interneuron types than excitatory types. But that depends who you are talking to, because if you talk to people that have been working for years looking at the dendrites and axons of the layers of the cortex in excitatory cell types, they will tell you this is not true. I mean, how can, how can you say we have more, more inhibitory cell types than excitatory cell types? But this is what they are offering. <laughs> no, so, again, it's almost as though, I mean, the, this kind of... Uh, of clustering. Of clustering and, mm -hmm. and, and genetic trees. Mm -hmm. I mean, it basically comes. The idea comes from genetics, right? Yes. In a way. Yes. But there, with genetics, we know that it's based on on uh, on code. Yes. You know that 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 that, that changes. You know, by mutations. Sure. Here, sure. They're just using those concepts, applying it to epigenetics. I, you know, it's it's it's. I guess it's the best thing going now. I mean, they now. they're not doing really epigenetics. I mean, that's, that's the idea. I mean, this is just, just gene expression. I right, mean, but, they, but that is epigenetics. I mean, they're, they're basically saying you get, you get from gene expression pattern A to gene expression pattern Z by going through uh, choice points where yeah. you change individuals and that there's therefore a, a, uh, arc, a, a hierarchical relationship there, right? But it, yes. I mean, I don't know. I guess it still has to be determined right uh, how I Yeah, and then I, I mean for epigenetic marks, I mean one of the idea of the Allen brain, when, when they came to give a talk we said, but are you actually going to use epigenetics for further, uh, mm -hmm. for further classify? And right now they are doing it more with electrophysiology, more morphology, but one of the ideas is to eventually go also to epigenetic marks. Because what this doesn't explore is epigenetic marks, they have no function, um, they started to do now uh, with connectivity, basically with whom you are connecting, but this is the brand new work from the Allen brain. So before it was uh, more about the, like the morphology itself, and now they want to explore more with whom you are connecting. Yeah, but there's another problem with it, because if you have all these data are what they call high dimensionality, so mm -hmm. to visualize that is just a huge nightmare. Yeah. And uh, most of most of the, the studies you look at uh, for transcriptome mm -hmm. in, in uh, 
I don't remember very nice one in Ethiopia, which is mm -hmm. my advice. But they use Disney, mm -hmm. which is like the, mm -hmm. the way to look at in two dimensions, and yes. where you have like 20, 35 dimensions, and you make clusters. But these clusters have nothing of that tree-like yeah. uh, dimension. That, yeah. So you don't make assumptions. It's just the best way to visualize something that's going to give you differences in proportion. So yes. is that a real tree, or is, it, or is that uh, just a way to look at cells so this, I mean, the way in which these branches are opening, for instance, the way in which these branches are opening, this is for visualization purposes. But um, I mean, they do use a tree for the. I will show you now after. In, I think in two slides it comes the the real tree. But this is just based on all these gene. All all neurons express this collection of genes. All inhibitory neurons express this connection. This collection of genes. So these pan inhibitory markers. And then these ones are the excitatory, and this is the way in which they present it. Right, but it's still a clustering. It's yes. not actually something that presumes that they, are, they have derived so, so much. No, 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 no. So if you go further, then these two clusters emerge for neurons. So what do you think these two clusters are? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And then, I mean, this is the inhibitory ones, and this is the excitatory core. So this is basically how they presented the data. I mean, you have, like, all these pinkish colors are the inhibitory cells, and all the bluish colors are excitatory cells, and these subtypes here are the non-neuronal types. So this is the way in which present, they, would, they presented where the tree is just the way in which they used to classify. And I'm sorry, each dot represents a gene that's expressed. At that particular in, point. In independent quantification, Level, or is it is it just basically on off? In this case, it's just it, it's expressed, but then there are other graphs where they have nodes with different sizes, where it is related to the gene expression level. And this is just um, they make something called vignettes, so that you can. This is just very for illustrative purposes, and they always advertise this one, but actually you can go inside the cell types data set and you can actually see which gene is expressed more and which less in what particular cell, cell point, uh, cell type. Okay, and then let me move to another data set. So one that I've been using is for the developing mouse brain and what they can offer are, these are embryos for mouse at different time points. So you have E11.5, E13.5, 15.5, E15.5, uh, and postnatal day P4, P14, P28. And if you go further, they have the adult mouse data set for P56, but this is in another data set. And what you can see is in which ages you want to evaluate your uh, gene expression pattern. And for example, I'm, I'm very fond of the PAC6 gene because it's expressed at the beginning in the ventricular zone and then further in the eyes. So you can here see where it's expressed at E11.5 and then later E13.5 that you can see it's localized in the eye and here. And then P15.5, you are also here in the eye. And here at this stage, you don't take the whole embryo, they just go into the brain. So you can see in which areas of the brain a particular gene is expressed. And what it's nice that they have is that you can overlap the expression with an atlas. So you can overlay, for instance, coordinates of what particular part is expressing if you compare it with the, with the atlas. So you can see what particular region is expressing that particular kind if you are overlapping both the atlas and the gene expression data set. So this is just, this is how the atlas looks. They use colors and use it in, in kinds of a hierarchy. 
So at the beginning, you have some red, which is this part here, and then so every part in the, in the atlas vocabulary is another area. And then they did all this analysis for different uh, gene expression for um, with in situ hybridization, or sorry, RNA. And then you can compare all these different data sets with the atlas overlapping it. So if you are interested where this gene responding tree is being expressed, then you overlay it with the atlas, and then you can at least know where this gene is expressed at these different time points. I mean, of course, they don't have a continuum of time points because every mouse they need to sacrifice it in order to create any of these images, but at least for these time points you can follow where particular genes are being expressed. And this is, this is the atlas that I was referring to with the colors. So of course development as, so the mouse is growing at these different times, with, at least from here to here, but at least you can see which structure is going to give rise to other structures. So you cannot follow exactly a particular voxel, which they have data in voxels, but you can have an estimate of what, what part of the brain is going to become another part. This is quite handy when you want to see different parts. And yeah, so that you have an idea of what kind of developmental time points they, they have. So here they have 11.5, 13.5, 15.5, 18.5, and then, and then here the mouse is born. And this is the process when the layers are being formed. I mean, because I'm interested in cortex, I put it on top. But here layer six is being formed, then five, four, two, and three, then geogenesis. And then at this point is when the long range projections start. So at least they have a nice, um, they have nice time points in which that they selected for doing this atlas. And yeah, before I go into the Allen brain, that at least I can show you where to access this data, I just want to acknowledge the people I've worked with in the past years for these projects. And of course, you too for fostering uh, science in Italy and the world. And let me go to the Allen brain website. So if you go to the Allen Brain website, you will, you will start in this website and you can see cell types database, which is the one where we were doing the clustering. Then you have Brain Observatory, where <coughs> they follow a cell of a mouse that is doing a particular task. So if the mouse is looking at a bar, horizontal bars, or vertical bars, then you can take the cell by cell ID and you can figure out what the mouse was doing when the cell was collected. Then they have the connectivity atlas, then they have the reference atlas that I was telling you about, then they have the adult mouse brain atlas at P56, then they have the development, developing mouse brain atlas that I just showed you, then they have more, they have the spinal cord, and they also have monkey and human, glioblastoma. This is ongoing, so they are every, probably every month, they, well, I don't know how often, but they release different data sets for the community and they have a lot of tutorials online on how to access the different websites and you can look it for very simple things like where is a particular molecule expressed but then you can also access the whole data, the whole data set by a, a to, to program a bit or they can explain you with the IPA, IPI how to access it so it's at least it's very flexible in data sharing and it's something that you can all profit from. So do you have any other questions? Yes, yes if you go to a, uh, your presentation and a slide with a, a gene expression um, GRN, uh -huh. what's it, regulatory network, mm -hmm. um, for that one for instance, any, any one that you have there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the fact that there are arrows coming, mm -hmm. for instance, to stop five from different uh, directions. Mm -hmm. Does it actually correspond to different cell types that get deposited in? I mean, there is on the way to, for instance, all these, all these colors. Yeah. Maybe let me put it nicely. 
So all this color is that this pathway of genes would lead you to produce layer six cells. But then things that are here are things that it can be sometimes um, by chance that it goes to one place or the other, uh, and that it's being pushed by, by the network. But usually this is what leads to the formation at the end, eventually, of the different cell types. So this is basically the pathway of genes. So you start with one gene that gets expressed, and then you can have, like, genes have a decision to go left or right, and then they choose left, and this is the potential pathway that they can take. So if you think of it in terms of the epigenetic landscape, I mean, imagine they're in the mountain, and then at, at the beginning, the cell is here, and then, I mean, when it's at the top, of it can go through this way, this way, this way. But once it's at this point, it cannot go to this point anymore. Well, at least it was not thought of it like that for many years. But he, well, at this point here, you are, for instance, in the middle of the network, for example, here. And then you can basically take the path to go to produce that particular gene. And now we know that you can actually do something like this under specific conditions, and that's why people won the Nobel Prize, and Gordon and Jamanaka for discovering this. But in this case, although in simulations we can observe this kind of behavior is not the, the normal, it's not the norm of what's happening. But you can see it in the Sometimes, years. yes. I mean, it's, I, I cannot tell you the, the percentage of cells that were doing that, but some cells would actually go back to the previous stages. Yeah, we also observed that during the simulations. Are there any other questions? Well, then, let's go for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>